Good afternoon, and thank you very much for coming to attend the presentation of Relief Therapeutics Holding. My name is Ram Selvaraju, and I'm chairman of the board of directors of Relief. So um, I'll briefly walk you through the creation of this company, which effectively was formed through the reverse merger of Relief Therapeutics SA, which is a Geneva-based, privately held biopharmaceutical company, with a publicly traded entity originally known as Therametrics, which was formerly a CRO, and which has now divested the CRO business. So as you can basically see here, um, effectively now we have a publicly listed biopharmaceutical company traded on the six under the ticker symbol RLF, under the name Relief Therapeutics Holding AG, which is headquartered in Zurich with offices in Geneva, and which has as its lead assets uh, entities coming from both the legacy pipeline of the original publicly traded company, as well as the lead asset that was brought in by the privately held Relief Therapeutics SA. Now, Relief Therapeutics SA was originally founded in order to bring in a molecule that was originally being developed by Serono, subsequently Merck Serono under Merck KGA, and which was discontinued in clinical development when Merck KGA elected to exit R&D activities in Switzerland. And Relief Therapeutics SA's co-founders, two of whom were former employees of Serono, brought in the molecule from Merck Serono and subsequently consummated a worldwide definitive licensing agreement for this molecule in August of 2015. Now the molecule in question is a recombinant uh, human interleukin-6, which is being positioned in treatment of peripheral neuropathies and which Relief Therapeutics SA originally developed as a low-dose pulsatile formulation uh, with subcutaneous administration. And I'll speak a little bit more about that in a second. But here you can see the overall strengths of the relief therametrics combination. Um, effectively, we have a strong and experienced board and management team, including both the co-founders of the Relief Therapeutics SA company, as well as the CEO and CFO of the former therametrics. We have secured long-term funding through an anchor shareholder, Global Emerging Markets, who have provided a 25 million Swiss franc share subscription facility. There is significant value creation potential from the company's pipeline assets, which as you will see, carry the hallmarks of cost-effective, capital-efficient, and rapid clinical development pathways. There is a strong compound pipeline, including both the lead asset, Atexakin Alpha, in peripheral neuropathy, as well as Aviptadil for the treatment of sarcoidosis. Attractive markets, as I said, short, non-capital intensive clinical trials, and a focused drug development company. And I'll speak a little bit more about its strategic focus in a second. So here's the pipeline, and as you can see, it's quite extensive. I'll focus my presentation primarily on discussion of these two assets here. Aviptadil, which is an inhaled formulation of vasoactive intestinal peptide, is being developed by the company in the orphan disease sarcoidosis. Now, sarcoidosis is a relatively common disease as far as orphan diseases go. It's estimated to afflict about 130,000 individuals in the U.S. and Europe alone. And 90% of patients with sarcoidosis manifest some form of lung pathology. And that's the most commonly found type of symptom in these patients. Accordingly, therefore, we believe that the development of the inhaled formulation of uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide, which we call aviptadil, should have significant therapeutic impact in patients with sarcoidosis across the broader sarcoidosis patient population. Phase three is ready to start. We have issued patents covering the inhaled formulation as well as orphan drug uh, status. Uh, we hold all of the worldwide rights except in Turkey and a few related countries which are held by Centurion Pharma, which is a regional player in those areas. And the total cost of running this phase three program, which is a single phase three trial, is under seven million euros. Ataxacin Alpha, as I said, is being developed in peripheral neuropathy. We're in preparation to enter phase two. There are issued patents in both the US and Europe, and of course this would be eligible for coverage under uh, the biological, protect, biological drug protection that exists in both the US and Europe. 12 years of exclusivity in the US, 10 years in Europe. And of course this came to us through a worldwide licensing agreement from Merck. 
And we have a broader pipeline here, which I won't discuss in detail, except to say that we have additional line extension opportunities for both aviptadil and atexacin alpha for aviptadil in acute lung injury and also potentially in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and for atexacin alpha in other types of peripheral neuropathy, including that induced by chemotherapy, which is a significant unmet medical need. These other assets are earlier stage and represent potential opportunities for outlicensing in the future. So as you can see here, we have a timeline for aviptadil and atexacin alpha, which include the imminent initiation of clinical development programs, which should allow us to drive the uh, two compounds that are the leads in our pipeline to the market in three to four years for aviptadil and roughly five years for atexacin alpha in sarcoidosis and diabetic neuropathy, respectively. I'll just provide you with a little bit of information on the orphan drug market. Clearly, many of you are familiar with this, how rapidly it's grown over the course of the past several years, as well as the fact that premium pricing is readily achievable with orphan drugs, as well as relatively rapid phase two and phase three development, where effectively we're looking at much smaller trial sizes, as shown here, as well as much shorter uh, timelines. In this case, uh, we're looking at the future potential for uh, viptidil in both uh, sarcoidosis and acute lung injury, as well as in COPD. Uh, there has, in fact, been positive phase two data generated in COPD already, so that could potentially be an indication that we may partner and choose to develop with a partner on board going forward, since clearly that's a much larger disease indication than either sarcoid or ALI. Uh, in the case of ALI, there's the added advantage of the fact that this is primarily a hospital-based indication and therefore would be targetable uh, with a relatively focused distribution channel. In terms of efficacy and safety, we would comment firstly that aviptadil being based on an endogenously occurring peptide is demonstrably non-toxic and is in fact already approved uh, as a localized injection for erectile dysfunction, although we don't hold the rights to that specific indication. But that clearly provides us with a certain degree of confidence that the safety hurdle has been met. And as I said, we have positive phase two data generated in COPD and mechanistic data generated in sarcoidosis, showing that it normalizes the dysregulated uh, immune function pathways in sarcoid patients. Uh, as you can see here, as I've commented previously, there's a relatively rapid path to market, and we have available material for phase three. We would be administering the drug via a portable nebulizer for which we have proprietary uh, IP protection. In the case of atexacin alpha, I'll simply point out that obviously diabetes is a global epidemic in the making. Uh, we're looking at roughly 450 million people with diabetes by the time by we reach 2030. In painful diabetic neuropathy, we're already looking at a market that is expected to reach 4.1 billion in 2019. And I would also point out one additional feature of the market which is very important. The currently marketed drugs are all analgesic in nature and none of them address the actual neuropathy. So in fact, what we are trying to bring to market now is a next generation therapy, a disease modifying uh, anti-neuropathic uh, drug, which effectively would be the only agent on the market if it receives regulatory approval to actually furnish the ability to regrow or regenerate uh, degenerated peripheral nerves. And that's what we think are, is the most compelling aspect of the atexacin alpha program. If you look here, first of all, there's a number of advantages to the atexacin alpha program which stem directly from its origins as an agent that came to us from the Merck Serono pipeline. Obviously, it was developed in keeping with a drug that has a big biotech, big pharma pedigree. We have a working cell bank, a stable clone. Uh, we, we also have a significant amount of clinical grade material that was manufactured by Serono, which came as part of the licensing transaction that we didn't have to pay additional money for, and that will allow us to go all the way through to phase three, potentially, without having to manufacture additional material. The rationale here is really based on the observation that normal individuals undergoing exercise produce atexacin alpha in response to exercise, and this molecule that's endogenously produced is known to drive the growth of peripheral nerves. In the case of diabetic patients, this response to exercise is disrupted or dysregulated, and they are unable to produce sufficient interleukin-6. 
So this is really just a way to address this defect by exogenously applying interleukin-6 in pulsatile low-dose form. And as I said before, there's a substantial uh, therapeutic window here because substantially higher doses of recombinant interleukin-6 have been used in phase two studies without significant side effects. So this summarizes the uh, license agreement with Merck. As you can see, there are no milestones, no royalties, no right of first refusal, uh, except in the case of where we commercialize, where uh, Merck Sorona would effectively be entitled to royalties accounting, to, accounting for 7% of net sales. Um, the clinical development path here, we have a uh, phase two program, in, which is uh, imminently going to start, and then we would move directly from that into phase two B and then into phase three. Um, I'll just uh, note here, these are the members of the Relief Therapeutics SA team. Michel Driano, Yves Sago, and Gaël Ledoux, who originally were part of bringing the molecule Latexakin Alpha out of Serono successfully. Dorian Bevec has been a long-time employee of the publicly listed company and has been instrumental in moving the Adiptodil program forward. Rafaela Petrona and Tim Snyder are both uh, the original CEO and CFO, respectively, of the original Therametrics company and are staying on in their respective positions, moving the company forward. We also have an experienced board of directors. I'll point out here, Dr. Antonino Amato has had a long career in clinical development associated with Sigma Tau. And I'll just point out a couple of other aspects which I think are pertinent. Uh, we've recently seen the successful fundraising accomplished by a Swiss company called AB2 Bio, which just like Relief, successfully brought a molecule out of Merck Serono and managed to capitalize this and move it through a clinical proof of concept study successfully. Obviously, many of you may be familiar with the GSK Axovan transaction. Uh, I would like to point out that in this case, Relief Therapeutics SA raised 2.5 million euros and obtained a worldwide development licensing transaction from Merck Serono involving the recombinant interleukin-6 program. And then, of course, I just point out the development of Vilazidone as an example of a molecule that was originally developed by Merck that was successfully developed in the hands of others and monetized through the acquisition of clinical data for $1.2 billion in 2012 by Forest Laboratories. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.